An important consequence of the misdiagnosis of bipolar depression is the use of antidepressants leading to either inefficacy or worsening of the illness. The patients often don't get better with the antidepressants if they have bipolar depression. That's been shown repeatedly in research studies. And sometimes they actually get worse with more and more mood episodes over time, a rapid cycling course, also shown in good randomized studies. So the main consequence is that people don't get better and sometimes they get worse. Mixed symptoms in depression are relevant because there's some evidence that shows that the dopamine blocker neuroleptic agents are effective, and there's some evidence that shows that the antidepressants are not effective and even potentially harmful. And since these patients tend to get diagnosed with just a major depressive episode, if people don't pay attention to the mixed features, then they'll get the antidepressants and not the dopamine blockers or not the mood stabilizers, which may also help the mixed state and then the mixed state gets worse, the depression gets worse on the antidepressant. So it's important to identify mixed states because the treatment is very different than non-mixed depression. I think that antidepressants are overused in bipolar illness and in mixed states, mostly because of the diagnostic system. It's set up so that people think that if you have a depressive episode of any kind, you should get an antidepressant, whether you're bipolar or unipolar, mixed or not mixed. And the scientific literature shows that that's not the case, that antidepressants don't work well in bipolar depression and in mixed states, and even in some kinds of unipolar depression. But the term major depressive episode has led people to just use antidepressants, no matter what the setting. And I think that's a simplistic and, and common, and unfortunately common, approach that needs to be replaced with a more sophisticated approach with um, an understanding of some of the scientific studies and not just focusing on the DSM diagnostic categories, which are not as well based scientifically often. A lot of times the comorbidities that people think about are not real because um, mood states can cause anxiety symptoms, cognitive symptoms, um, personality changes, and so if you treat the mood state, there really aren't other comorbidities often. The apparent adult ADD goes away, there's no borderline personality, the, the generalized anxiety symptoms get better. You have to focus on treating the mood state first. That being said, sometimes people do have some comorbidities even after the mood state's better. And then if they have generalized anxiety, for instance, I tend to recommend using benzodiazepines rather than serotonin reuptake inhibitors because the latter can worsen the bipolar illness. If they have cognitive issues, there might be some benefits in choosing specific kinds of medications that might be better for the brain, such as lithium, which is neuroprotective. If they have personality problems and it's still there and persistent even after the mood condition is taken into account, then sometimes that comorbidity exists, like borderline personality or severe PTSD, and then they need the appropriate psychotherapies for that condition. The most overlooked symptoms in bipolar disorder that lead to misdiagnosis could be summarized as depression, anxiety, and cognitive problems. For example, we see people who have mood symptoms, complaining of depression, loss of interest, so-called anhedonia, who also, in fact, have a syndromal level of depressive symptoms who reach out to a healthcare provider, uh, also often voicing anxiety as a complaint, wherein the patient's report of symptoms tend to be overemphasizing the depressive symptoms, and for a variety of reasons, the past history of hypomania or mania is, in fact, just not recalled or, in many cases, is not recalled accurately. Uh, and this, in fact, shifts, I think, inadvertently or kind of implicitly the diagnostician, the clinician, towards depression as the working diagnosis. The other part is cognition. We very often see people who complain of impulsivity, who complain of difficulties focusing, concentrating. And this often is presented either as those complaints and or as functional problems related to those complaints. They just can't perform at work the way they once could. And very often these folks will leave the office with a diagnosis of depression, because we know depression is linked to cognitive problems and anxiety.
but also ADHD, or attention deficit hyperactivity, or attention de deficit disorder. There are many different misdiagnoses that occur in bipolar disorder, but those are two that jump out, or you know, the depression and ADHD in most outpatient practices. Certainly in the inpatient unit, the presence of psychosis can sometimes send us diagnostically astray. Psychosis is not synonymous with schizophrenia. Uh, very often on the inpatient unit, a person presenting with an affective episode with psychosis could have bipolar. So I think, in fact, that the message is, is that anyone presenting with a confluence of difficulties with thinking or problems with depression, anxiety, should be screened and probed for bipolar hypomania or mania. The consequences of misdiagnosis in bipolar disorder are not insignificant. First of all, we know it's a common problem. Uh, there's been many, many surveys conducted of people who have bipolar disorder. Uh, there's been surveys conducted in academic centers that indicate that the majority of people have been misdiagnosed or there's not been a timely diagnosis. The diagnosis was made accurately, but not for many, many years later. And the consequences are obvious. This is, in fact, illness. This is active illness, which is, in fact, left to progress. This interferes with quality of life, with function, with relationships, and other important patient-centric outcomes, patient-reported outcomes. The other part is, is that we've got uh, plenty of evidence now to indicate that the illness can progress biologically. In other words, we see changes in the brain. We see changes in the body in terms of cardiovascular health, indicating that there's an acceleration, if you will, of this illness process. On the surface, we know that when patients have bipolar, they have a recurrent cyclical illness in many cases, and the delay and or misdiagnosis unnecessarily adds to that progression that we see, which could manifest as more chronic illness and or more cognitive difficulties, which is the principal mediator of psychosocial outcome and workplace performance. So taken together, progression is first of all modifiable, and it's been shown in fact to have phenomenological as well as neurobiological changes that add up to unnecessary decreases in optimal patient reported outcomes. Results from epidemiological and clinical studies indicate that individuals with bipolar disorder are affected by both psychiatric and medical comorbidities more than any other psychiatric population. There's a very long list of concurrent conditions that people with bipolar disorder are uh, more likely to be experiencing. I'll just mention two in the psychiatric comorbidity category, that being the anxiety disorders and the substance use disorders or alcohol use disorders. The most common of the medical comorbidities that we see are endocrine, that being thyroid dysfunction, and or cardiometabolic disorders like hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, or frank diabetes. So the clinician who, in fact, is uh, um, uh, part of the care of someone with bipolar disorder needs, in fact, to have a contemporaneous attention to not just, in quotes, bipolar, but the concurrent conditions because the implications are that comorbid conditions interfere with optimal illness trajectory, optimal uh, response to treatment and health outcomes, and how that has a concrete relevance to the treatment selection is, in the example of medical comorbidities, we in fact do not want to give people treatments that add to the medical burden. And too often patients receive uh, in the sequence, in the algorithm of therapies, first or second line, therapies that are causing or exacerbating weight problems and metabolic problems, which is already an intrinsic problem in the disorder. So comorbidities are not just of academic interest, they're not just uh, of importance to us to be aware of it because we can, it can affect illness trajectory and prognostication, we know it has direct implications for how we might be thinking about uh, treatment selection. Finally, as far as just a sort of a, a care plan, I think that the evidence is now very clear that the optimal outcome in bipolar disorder is a contemporaneous attention to both. That is, paying attention to both problems uh, uh, you know, at the same time, contemporaneously, over time. That seems to result in better outcomes for patients. Right now, our work at Mayo Clinic uh, 
which is focusing on bipolar disorder biomarkers, has not made a clear advance and transformation into clinical practice. Our hope is that that will be a future transformation that can help patients and their healthcare providers better individualize treatments for bipolar depression. If I was to answer, are, are there some biomarkers now that we do use in practice? To some extent, they are not biomarkers for current FDA-approved treatments for bipolar depression. But invariably, given the density of depression, we will often work with antidepressant medications. This is where, for some patients with bipolar depression, identifying serotonin transporter genotype and or pharmacokinetic genetic variation, particularly around 2D6 antidepressant uh, pathways, may have some relevance, but I would emphasize this is anecdotal evidence that's not been formally tested with large-scale clinical trials. Comorbidities that impact how we think about treatments for bipolar depression can be psychiatric and can be medical. The comorbidities that really, I think, are common that make an impact in what we might choose for treatments from a pure psychiatric standpoint really relate to substance use disorders and anxiety disorders. If someone with bipolar depression is actively drinking, that may impact the type of treatments that I will think about for that depressive phase of illness. And a concept that we'll often use uh, is if, if a medicine or treatment could be helpful for both. So for example, mood stabilizing anticonvulsants can help patients detox safely from alcohol. And there may be an element of mood stabilization that uh, we can use in the context of treating bipolar depression. If some patients with bipolar depression have migraines or headaches, we may see particular medicines uh, be helpful both for mood and headache. From a medical comorbidity standpoint, it's not so much a particular treatment as being helpful for both as it is making sure that the clinical treatment for the depressive phase of bipolar disorder does not exacerbate or make a medical condition worse. And I think the evidence and where we focus a lot of our efforts is on weight neutrality and not fueling further problems with obesity, dyslipidemia, diabetes. Music